So pieces of this, they say it came down and started some fire, but even this in the official, um, their official story says that, in fact, no, that wasn't the, the cause of this. They say there was one column that went in here that started a cascade effect and the thing rippled, which is totally impossible. Why it, not, yeah. Eight stories. It's ten stories a second. I mean, Frankly, I never understood how the trade towers came down so straight. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. It hits up here. Yeah. These columns on this side would have to fail faster than the columns on the other it side, even though. So yeah, the top would topple, even if the rest of it would start to go down. And when it hits, there would be resistance, just like when you take a hammer and hit a nail, your your hammer bounces back a little bit. It's, right, it's right. Second law. This is Ted Walker. He's going to tell you all about uh, lidar mapping. So you know you're going to get it before and after. It is pretty incredible. Yeah. With LIDAR mapping. <laughs> so here's building seven. Right. Right in its own footprint. But the splay on these was incredible. It was something like two football fields apart. So the way that they collapse, even though they both collapse, we think with, you know, explosives, um, which again, NIST wouldn't even go there. They wouldn't even take into consideration the explosives, and there were hundreds of eyewitnesses, mm. firefighters, first responders, that they wouldn't even accept that as testimony. How are you doing? Did you know a third tower fell on 9-11? I, I, you know, I came by here the other day, and I, I was reading that, and I did not know. It's amazing. Uh, most architects and engineers know nothing about it, and yet it's the third worst structural failure in modern history. So we're looking for a new investigation because NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, eight, seven years after 9-11 came out with their final report that, saying that those fires, the worst fires we have in the building, brought that building down in yeah. seven seconds. And so we have a huge problem with that because it obviously can't, these fires can't cut all 82 columns in the building which is what would be required in order to bring this building down at free fall symmetrically. So we, an AIA, of which I'm a member, bought into it. You can sign our petition um, also. That, now I'm, we have 100 people who have signed this petition. Chris, did you know we have 100 people that have signed this petition in the last couple of I'm gonna let you go without asking you to join the 2,700 other architects and engineers calling for a new investigation. And thank you very much. How do you think it's coming down? By fire or by controlled demolition? Or something else? Fire. Fire? Because uh, NIST uh, agreed. Like the other, the other building. Uh -huh. These are the fires that are said to have brought this building down. So I wanted to ask you, do you think that these fires could bring that building down in seven seconds, asymmetrical, scattered, small fires, 47-story skyscraper. No skyscrapers ever come down due to fire. Um, what, so it's, it's, it's an, a very important, most architects initial report, the evaporation of the ends of the steel beams looking like Swiss cheese, an invasion of the steel by molten iron. And that doesn't happen by office fires or jet fuel. Jet fuel is just a hydrocarbon. It doesn't burn hotter. What we have found by a small team of scientists is small red-gray chips of nanothermite. What we have found by the USGS is billions of iron microspheres, the diameter of a human hair, which is elemental iron, which is the byproduct of the incendiary thermite. So the evidence is very tight leading to the destruction of the t uh, building seven by thermite or, or nanothermite. That's why we're going to appreciate it. Richard, a few quick questions. Um, yeah, yeah, structure, the evidence for controlled demolition in this building. Um, we've got a lot to talk about. The fact that fi high fires have never brought down a high rise, because the official story says that these fires brought that building down in seven seconds. That's NIST came out with their official report seven years later. He's in in three minutes. 
three minutes. He's not done yet. Well, I know, but... Those that incendiaries brought the building down, melted steel beams. It's incredible. All right, hold on, hold on. So I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to do your own research. You're welcome to have that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. It turns out that um, most architects and engineers are unfamiliar with the third worst structural failure in modern history. How many of us, like me, uh, a few years ago, knew nothing about the third tower before today? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And this is a, an incredibly important uh, event in our history of design professionals because here we have the first time in history fires bringing down a skyscraper according to the official story. So that's what we're going to be looking at today and your, your CEU credits will automatically be sent to you if you have scanned them. But we're going to um, become aware of the, this third worst structural failure, World Trade Center Building 7. We're going to understand and critique NIST's theory of normal office fires for the cause of this building's collapse. And we'll, we'll learn about the history of high-rise fires as well and evaluate the evidence for the explosive demolition, which is what many researchers have found as the cause of this building's collapse, so that you can determine for yourself what the cause is according to your own, uh, in, your own informed opinion. So we have a website. It's ae911truth.org. We're going to fly through this information this morning. And I encourage you to look deeper into the subject uh, on the website. We'll be using the We've had it for 100 years. Uh, we formulate a question. We ask. We do background research. We construct a hypothesis, our best guess as to what brought this building down, test it with experiments, analyze the results, draw conclusions, and report our findings in an open, transparent manner. So that's what we'll be using, and we'll be looking at NIST's use of the scientific method in their conclusions. Uh, so let's get started and apply this. How have uh, high-rises come down? Well, certainly, uh, fire has never brought down a high-rise, but in a wood frame building, say, we have large gradual deformations. The building would fall over to the path of least resistance, not straight down through the greatest path. Uh, the, in, in the case of uh, high-rise buildings, uh, the thousands of tons of structural steel columns supporting the building. So uh, there's only enough fuel in an office fire to burn 20 minutes in a given area. We have several examples of very hot, large, and long-lasting fires in high-rises, about 100 of them. Not one of them has come down, though, not in Los Angeles that burned three and a half hours over five floors, not in Caracas, Venezuela that burned 17 hours over 26 floors. There are high-rises, or mid-rises in this case, that have come down. We don't have the structural elements dismembered one from another. Uh, the, we can see a building mangled at the bottom, certainly, but it concrete, the concrete is not pulverized to a fine powder. Buildings can be destroyed by explosives. There's thick, billowing, enormous pyroclastic-like clouds. Uh, there's witnesses that hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light. If we have these features, we know we have explosions. So this is very important for us as we start to look at the, at the cause of other high-rises that have come down, where thousands of explosives are harnessed very carefully in an engineered preset sequence to bring high-rises like this down. So we have a free-fall collapse because the thousands of tons of columns have been removed. We often have a symmetrical collapse because the building doesn't fall over because all those columns are removed at once. The building is broken up into shippable components and we minimize damage to adjacent structures. So that's fairly typical and there's a set of features that go with controlled demolition. We'll be looking at these quite rapidly today and we'll come back to them. But all of these features compose proof of controlled demolition. Now fire can't bring, cause any of these features of controlled demolition, let alone all of them. So we'll be comparing Building 7's destruction by hypothesis of destruction by fire to the hypothesis of destruction by controlled demolition based on these features. Let's begin. 
Many of us are not familiar with the collapse of this building, easily the tallest building in most of our states. World Trade Center Building 7 certainly dwarfed next to the Twin Towers uh, in the case of New York. It wasn't hit by an airplane. So our, our um, isolating Building 7 as, a, as an example can be really helpful. Here it is after the towers came down that morning about 9 or 10 o'clock. And it's doing fine. It had some minor damage. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, says this is not a consequential significant factor in the building's collapse. Nor is diesel fuel, which is a common myth out there, nor is the shaking of the ground upsetting the foundation. They cite normal office fires, which is in contradiction to the evidence that we're going to be looking at today of the explosive controlled demolition, beginning with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Well, let's listen to Dan, rather, as he cites his theory on the spot as to how this building came down. The first look at World Trade Center Building 7 for some of us. Uh, John, we do need volume on, um, so if we could Kate, if you find a volume control, that would be helpful. If you don't, let's find John. <clears throat> so certainly it's a sudden onset. Is there a symmetrical descent? Uh, let's see. Let's take a closer look. And take a look at the penthouse. Uh, the penthouse drops half a second prior to the overall building, indicating core column failure, all the core columns, 24 of them, at once, a half a second prior to the perimeter columns which then go down all at once. So this is pretty extraordinary, uh, but let's compare it to a controlled demolition. Uh, on the right, building seven on the left, is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? But NIST did not do this. They came out with their report seven years later blaming normal office fires. They never seriously looked at the hypothesis of controlled demolition, even though it obviously looks exactly like one, and even though fire has never brought down a skyscraper, ever. And these are the fires we're talking about in this building, the worst fires that we have photographic or video evidence of. Those fires were burned out an hour before the collapse of this building on the floors where NIST says that they were that what NIST says the initiation of collapse was. Uh, the fires are active at 2.30 p.m., but burned out on the 12th and 13th floor, the floors where the initiation of collapse was said to have begun by thermal expansion. And column 79 is the area of critique for NIST where they cite their specific theory of thermal expansion causing these long span beams on the left pushing this heavy girder on the right off of its seat on column 79 causing floor 13 to fall on 12, 12 on 10, 10 on 9 leaving that column unbraced for 9 floors which then it buckled causing the vertical failure all the way up to the roof and then this failure traveled horizontally through the building according to the the, the official theory here, and then having gutted the inside of this building, then the outside comes down about 10 seconds later. Now there's a number of reasons none of this can actually be true. First of all, uh, the, the fireproofing on these beams uh, would have protected them from expanding thermally. Fires only, there's only enough fuel for 20 minutes of fire in, in this building. Uh, there are shear studs that would have bound the composite structure, the slab, to the beams underneath. And this girder had shear studs as well, which NIST actually denies, but that the shop drawings show. And we also have the requirement of having pushed this girder at least seven inches in order to fall off of its seat. So NIST ignores the stiffeners that were placed at the flange to web connection, or joint at the flange and web uh, end of the flange and web uh, at column 79. So they do that in order to suggest that it wouldn't have had to have pushed so far off. 
Even if that had all happened, we wouldn't have the 13th floor falling because there are three other girders firmly connecting into that same column which would have supported that floor. But even if that would have happened, we wouldn't have ha had uh, a, a pancaking collapse because if we did and the entire interior of this building was gutted, we would see massive deformation on the perimeter exterior structure and breaking of granite panels and the windows. There are, and we don't see that kind of massive damage. But even in their computer model, which they use to prove the hypothesis of destruction by fire, uh, we can see that they have to set loose in their computer model 400 structural steel connections to failure every second in order to achieve anything like a free fall collapse that we're gonna be looking at. And you can see it even begins to tip over. And they don't show us what happens after the first two seconds of collapse because it does begin to tip over. So their, their computer model actually disproves their theory. But it does show massive deformation, which would have happened in any kind of a natural collapse. How do we bring a building straight down into its own footprint? We have to remove all 82 columns at once on at least eight floors because that's the period of the distance over which this building falls at free fall and symmetrically. Can't, does fire have that level of precision? We don't think so. Fire's never brought down a skyscraper as you've seen. How fast is the building coming down? We can see the downward momentum gaining every second. It fits the free fall curve perfectly. NIST originally denied that the building came down at free fall. They were embarrassed publicly by physicists and they end up acknowledging this. It says if eight stories of this building were suddenly removed, that's how a building can fall that far at free fall. They do admit this, but they do not admit the implications. The building is completely dismembered. That is its structural elements, one beam from a column. We had a 47-story moment-resisting steel frame structure reduced to a pile four stories tall like a house of cards. That couldn't happen in a natural collapse. Remember, natural collapses, we see what's left over, a mangled building, the structure's partially intact, at least. We would have witnesses of explosions if there, if there were. Well, we have many, many witnesses of explosions. Kevin McPadden is one. He says, uh, it's like you wanted to grab onto something, like, ba-boom! And that's what we would have if we had John here to turn up our volume. And we, and you can see this, uh, in fact, if you go to YouTube and Google Experts Speak Out, you'll see our landmark DVD. And in that DVD, you'll hear all of these witnesses of explosions, none of which appear in the official reports put out by NIST for World Trade Center 7. Barry Jennings was on his way back into the building because it had been evacuated after the planes hit the towers. M most of the buildings around the area were. So nobody theoretically died in the building. And this gentleman is talking about his experience of being blown around by explosions in the building because he went back into the building after they were evacuated. So there were explosions going on uh, during the afternoon. Uh, explosions like witnessed by these first responders the afternoon of 9-11 near Building 7. So his reaction and the sound of this massive explosion is what we're hearing here. Do we have enormous pyroclastic clouds? Yes, we'll come back to that. But this is building five. If any of these buildings at World Trade Center uh, site were going to fall due to fire, we'd expect it to be this one, which was fully engulfed in fire. Did it come down? No. Mid-rise, high-rise offices don't come down due to fire. And not even in China, where we have the 44-story Mandarin Hotel completely engulfed, floor to ceiling. Uh, did it come down? Nope. Um, here's before on the left, after on the right, slightly toasted around the edges, uh, put back into use. The reason, fireproofing mainly, uh, and even without fireproofing, tests have shown that steel frame buildings, the steel will soften and sag but it will not fail. The connections typically do not fail in these tests. Yet these small fires brought this building down symmetrically in seven seconds due to um, 
due to what? We'll be looking at that, but uh, in like a house of cards. Uh, so even the FEMA report, which initially we had in 2002, uh, had $600,000 of funding, what, and then the NIST report threw all of that out, and very important documentation, which we're going to be looking at, and brought and the NIST report uh, came in and took over the over the uh, the investigation. But FEMA documented the specifics of the fire in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown. So they spent $600,000 and they weren't willing to finger fire as the best hypothesis. They say it has a, pro, a low probability of occurrence. The hypothesis is not corroborated. What do we do in the scientific method when the hypothesis is not corroborated? We go back and we find one that stands a better chance against the evidence, the scientific forensic uh, and the testimony of the witnesses. Further research, investigation, and analysis are needed to resolve this issue. Unfortunately, though, for those hoping to resolve the issue, this steel, the, the evidence in a crime scene was illegally destroyed, sent to China for recycling within two weeks after 9-11 before engineers could look and analyze it in the worst structural failure that's ever happened in modern history that should have been the most studied building that each one of us as architects and engineers should know about and every school should be studying. Crucial evidence that it can answer many questions is on the slow boat to China, cites Bill Manning, editor of Fire Engineering Magazine, showing an astounding ignorance of government official value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately. What do the experts say? Well, here's Danny Jewenko, the top European controlled demolition expert. He's shown on a laptop this building coming down. Without being told this happened on 9-11, he says it simply starts from below. They've blown away the columns. It's a controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. Contr professional work, without a doubt. Well, we have 79 PE structural engineers as part of the 2,600 architects and engineers demanding a new investigation of what happened at the World Trade Center. He says a localized failure in a steel frame building like World Trade Center 7 cannot cause a catastrophic, catastrophic collapse like a house of cards uh, without a patterned loss and simultaneous loss of several of its columns at key locations within the building. We have extreme heat produced, documented by multiple sources, including Bechtel documenting 2,800 degrees at the World Trade Center site. Now the fires and even jet fuel can only get to be about 500, maybe 1,000 degrees. NIST actually claims 1,800 degrees, but still, that is 1,000 degrees short of what was documented here. Pools of literally molten steel, says the president of the cleanup company. And these gentlemen say, Molten steel running down the channel like you're in a foundry. They're shocked. They've never seen this in fire scenes before. Where could it possibly come from? Let's leave the volume at that level for the duration. Uh, for a molten steel beams to human remains. The streams of molten metal that leaked from the hot cores flowed down broken walls into the foundation hole. S molten metal dripping from the beam. The end of the beam would be dripping with molten steel, like you see here. Molten material falling out of the material in this, the jaws of this crab clock. Jonathan Barnett, the author of the original FEMA report documenting in Appendix C of this 2002 report, steel members in the debris pile appear to have been partially evaporated. That takes four thousand degrees to evaporate steel. Office fires aren't the answer. Abul Hazan Astani Asl documents this very carefully as he looks, looks through the steel at the Fresh Kills landfill. The, the, uh, you saw melting of girders, as you see here. This is not common in office fires. It's, it's never happened before, in fact. Here's, here's Appendix C, melting, capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese like you see here from this piece of steel from WTC7. Rapid oxidation, sulfidation, where does the sulfur come from? 
Sulfur is not a component of our buildings. It's added to thermite, an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter to become much more effective. We'll look at thermite in a minute. Liquid iron, that's molten iron, documented by the official FEMA report. Hot corrosion attack on the steel. What can create these temperatures? Not office fires. Structural steel melts at 2750 degrees Fahrenheit. Thermite is a possibility. Let's look at it. It creates temperatures exceeding 4,000 degrees and produces the temperatures associated that you see here from this molten iron or steel falling out of the crab claw. Is there chemical evidence, though, well, in the World Trade Center uh, aftermath of thermite? And what is thermite anyway? An incendiary used by the military. Thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit quite enough to liquefy steel. We you know take 10 pictures ranging from that side to that side to uh, with a close-up of me with the screen in the background with various slides. I've got a whole, I've taken about 30 yeah. pictures. Not close-ups with just me and the screen okay. from here, here, here. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. Fascinating. We have a source for the molten iron. We have a source for the sulfur. We have a source for the massive heat, none of which can be explained by the account of the official story produced by NIST. In fact, they acknowledged they never looked for explosives or incendiaries. After claiming that they didn't find them, they acknowledge in writing that they never looked for them. And they still refuse to do so. But other scientists did. In fact, in the back... <laughs> Devices can be produced and built in your backyard by this civil engineer, Jonathan Cole. In fact, they there were devices that are cutter charges that are patented prior to 9-11 that use thermite and issue it in millis hundreds, hundreds of milliseconds cutting through structural steel. Now, normal controlled demolitions, they use high energy explosives like C4 or RDX, but those produce very loud bangs, very bright flashes. So this material, which was apparently used at the World Trade Center, Building 7, uh, they, they may not have wanted those particular audio and visual signatures. So what else, what else was found by the USGS, by R.J. Lee, an environmental consulting firm, in the World Trade Center dust, which is 30% concrete, massive amounts of pulverized concrete. R.J. Lee finds small iron microspheres, molten iron previously molten iron, the diameter of a human hair, billions of them, in all the World Trade Center dust. And the chemical constituent of this is fascinating. It, it is indeed elemental iron, so it's not melted steel. Uh, it's a signature component. It's so ubiquitous in all the World Trade Center dust. It's not even World Trade Center dust unless it has this component. So. They don't explain it, though. They have no explanation as to where they came from. But as we, as we noted, iron is the byproduct of thermite. So if you had molten iron laced throughout the columns and beams in the building and under explosive conditions, liquid forms itself, it aerosolizes, and then forms itself into a sphere. And under pressure, they get that small, the diameter of human hair. So the, the chemical analysis shows uh, iron uh, and, and other components typical in controlled experiments like this, where thermite is set off. And you see, in slow motion, thousands and thousands, just in this small ex sample experiment, of 
liquid molten iron microspheres that cool and they form and they fall with all the dust, which is the only rational explanation for the iron microspheres and for the toasting of the tops of these cars in the surrounding area, for which there's no other rational example or explanation. But what else is found in the World Trade Center dust? By a small team of scientists led by Niels Herod in Copenhagen, four independently collected samples, like this one across the street from the South Tower in Jeanette McKinley's apartment, the same red-gray chips, very curious, very small, multi-layered. The red side is fascinating. Uh, they zoom into it with an electron microscope and find, well, first of all, the chemical analysis, uh, oxygen, aluminum, iron, silica, uh, aluminum and iron being the major components of thermite. And so why is ther the elements of thermite found in the World Trade Center dust residue? This is not paint because they zoom into the red layer and they find extremely small rhomboidal crystalline particles of iron oxide and aluminum platelets, the key ingredients of thermite set in an organic bed of oxygen, silica, carbon, which when added to the, an incendiary, the organic material can make it more explosive. The size of these particles is a thousand times smaller than a human hair. These are nanoscale particles. They're built from the atomic scale up, extremely sophisticated material. At 420 degrees centigrade in a heater, they ignite, producing even hotter temperatures of 2800 degrees, capable of melting the, uh, the material producing iron microspheres, which have in fact the same chemical ingredients uh, of the microspheres found in all the World Trade Center dust that was unexplained by the USGS and RJ Lee. So we know where those spheres came from. They came from that thermite or nanothermite, as if we didn't know because they are found also partially with partially ignited chips with spheres attached to them. This is damning evidence for the official story of destruction by normal office fires. Uh, it's called super thermite. It's been out in the literature somewhat in the last um, 20, 15, 15, 20 years before 9-11. And uh, it's very sophisticated. Lawrence Livermore Lab describes it as super thermite because of the extremely small particle size. The chemical reaction is instantaneous or explosive. Uh, very, very sophisticated material. It's, this, this work is in a 25-page peer-reviewed paper in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal, and it stands uncontested by other peer-reviewed papers that say, no, this can't be true. That's paint, you know? That's what they say. This is paint. Well, it's not paint. Paint doesn't have these exotic properties. So what we've learned today is that we have the 10 key characteristic features of controlled demolition, and we have an hour-and-a-half video on this subject, by the way, online. Just uh, go to YouTube, search Experts Speak Out. Uh, and we have a couple of copies left at our booth. And um, you can have those for free. And we'll be giving a presentation tonight. Uh, it's actually a film on this subject with firefighter Eric Lawyer, who has 200 firefighters calling for a new investigation of the destruction of these towers. And because we have serious questions about the Twin Towers as well. We're only able to focus on Building 7 at our conference here. So that is in Watertown tonight at 6.30. Want to make sure you, have, you do have an invitation and a flyer in your brochure if you can make it. Um, and we will send any of you a free DVD if you email us uh, from the website uh, for sure because we're starting to run out. If you run over to the booth and said, can I still get a free DVD? Uh, Henry back here might be able to find one for you if we're lucky. But the 10 characteristic features, sudden onset of destruction, straight down symmetrical collapse, patterned removal of column supports, free fall acceleration, meaning no resistance, the total dismemberment of the structural steel system, uh, the limited damage to adjacent structures, sounds of explosions heard by witnesses, and we also have flashes of light seen by witnesses in the DVD that you'll see. Molten iron indicating extreme hot temperatures, unaccountable for by the official story 
evidence of thermite incendiaries, all of which is direct proof of explosive demolition. No characteristic of destruction by fire, i.e. fire cannot cause any of these, let alone all 10 of them. With additional corroborating evidence that you'll see in the video and that we partially talked about today, we believe that this is proof of controlled demolition. At this point, uh, I want to tell you that that's the reason that we have 2,700 architects and engineers demanding a new investigation. And we are co-sponsoring, we are sponsoring a resolution in 2016 calling upon the AIA for a new investigation. And we can get that, we're calling, asking them to call upon Congress for a new investigation, an independent investigation, not by NIST, but by some other reputable uh, firm. Now, the AIA did, in fact, look at the, uh, the NIST report, and they did endorse it. So we're, that's one of the reasons we have to work very hard. How many AIA members do we have here today? Awesome. We're asking you guys specifically for your support. If you can fill out that form you have in front of you, you and check the box at the top, put your AIA number, you'll be co-sponsoring with us. We now have 100 AIA members co-sponsoring. And so we, we need everyone we can get so we can have a show of support. And that concludes my presentation. I'm, oh, it doesn't. Uh, so sign the petition even if you're not an AIA member. And this is the resolution. We have a copy of it at our, uh, our booth. You can sign up for our email newsletter. If you sign the petition, you'll get an email newsletter. Here's our booth. It's the one right next door. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, I'll be here to answer. We can be here until 1245 talking. Thank you so much. <laughs> Charter that said, explain the destruction of these towers by fire. Anybody see a problem with that charter? It's not an open-minded, how did these buildings come down? Explain it by fire. That's, so they did their job. They explained it the best, as best they could by fire. Now, uh, Michael Newman is their public spos spokesperson at NIST in Baltimore. And um, you, can, you, can, you can talk to him. He'll actually answer questions. Did I answer your question, though? Nobody's answered the, how a building can fall at free fall due to fire. We've made the case for destruction by sources other than fire. Right. What group or individual has taken our, our information point by point and attempted to refute it? There are uh, what we call debunkers, people who believe the official story, who have looked at our, de our information. And we've debated one of their top people. His name is Chris Moore, M-O-H-R. He's in Denver, Colorado. On our website, AE911 Truth, you can see a point by point, counterpoint and point, um, debate. It's, it's a fascinating study. But NIST has not taken these point by point. There has been some hand waving like, oh, that's just paint. Well, you saw very exotic, exotic properties that are not paint. They have saying, oh, well, we explained that it came down uh, uh, due to uh, normal office fires in thermal expansion. And, but they don't explain how it could have come down in free fall. And, nor why their computer models are diametrically opposed to the collapse process uh, that we see in the videos. So NIST has not done that. We would expect and want them to do that. We've invited them into discussion. They will not talk to us. We've showed up at their door. We've given them our DVDs, our petition when we had 1,000 architects and engineers. And every year, well, every time we get to 1,000, we go to Congress. We give them our DVD. We give them our, our petition. And when we had 1,000, when we had 2,000, and we're coming up on 3,000, we'll do the same thing. Yes? Do you, do you have any thoughts about whether it was something that was stored there or whether it was intentionally said? Or yeah, great it? question. The implications of the thorough largest controlled demolition in history are that it would take months and dozens of operatives access to the building to place these explosives after engineering them. This is a 
obviously a very uh, thorough event that would have to have the, uh, the uh, cooperation of security. So we certainly want an investigation of the security company, which is Stratacom or Securisec, which went out of business after 9-11. Uh, and under whose noses all this would happen. We don't think that Al-Qaeda could have gotten access to this building or the Twin Towers, very highly secure buildings. And in this case, the IRS, the CIA, the Department of Defense, Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management, which was designed to handle any emergency in the city uh, that could possibly happen, was on the 23rd floor of this building. So. It appears to be some sort of an inside operation. We don't have theories about how that works. We're focused on the scientific forensic evidence at the crime scene, and we're asking criminal investigators to come forth and do something with it. It's very difficult, though, to get the attention of authorities in the judicial, executive, or legislative branches of our government. Did you want to follow up? because we see the building fall symmetrically, which means the column on this side of the building was taken out at precisely the same instant as the column on the other side of the building, and all the rest of the columns, except for the core columns, which must have been taken out a half a second prior, because we see the penthouse drop, which is supported by those core columns, uh, a half a second prior. You couldn't have one bomb on one side, bringing a building down symmetrically, it would fall over towards its damaged side, yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, I, I heard firefighters at World Trade Center, that's all I heard. Gant, I'm going to ask you to come up and ask that question with a microphone so everybody can hear it. I can't even hear it. I'm so sorry. We don't have great acoustics here. But thank you. I talked to a number of firefighters that were involved in the uh, World Trade Center collapse, and, and one of them very passionately said that the, the building fell down because the codes were changed to allow them to eliminate the concrete fireproofing around the columns. And I'm wondering if uh, uh, you have any comments on that and, uh, or, or if it's true. And great question. A, I don't know that the codes were changed that they ever required concrete fireproofing. Of course, what we have in the World Trade Center uh, 7, 1, and 2 is sprayed on fireproofing. And in, in the case of uh, WTC 7, that sprayed on proofing survived. You ready? Okay. So, um, what we, what we, uh, so, so no, I don't believe it, it's true that, that there were code violations. In fact, NIST uh, cites that the, the fireproofing actually did its job with the exception in the World Trade Center 1 and 2, the towers, that uh, the, air, the force of the imp airplane impact knocked the fireproofing off of the lightweight steel trusses. This is beyond our scope today, but they then said those trusses sagged and that pulled in the perimeter columns and that may cause them to buckle, causing, the, in the case of the North Tower, the 15-story section to push down the rest of the building to the ground and then destroy itself. And that doesn't work for a number of reasons. Uh, we don't see that in the videos. We see the upper 15 stories destroying itself. There's nothing left to drive the rest of the towers down. See the rest at Experts Speak Out, which if you Google, you'll see our free online one-hour DVD of the Twin Towers in Building 7. Thanks again, everybody. I'll take your questions outside. we got to allow the next speaker. <laughs>